loving it, loving it. Okay. Hey. Here, uh, a little behind schedule today, but we are here for another episode of Speaking Legally, where the legal meets the cultural. We have uh, one of our co-hosts here because one is traveling abroad, but this is Dr. Stacey N.C. Grant. I'm joined by Royce Russell Esquire, and it is July 22nd, 2020. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe we're already in July. Like, where did the time go? But thank you all, our loyal followers. Yeah, I know you were concerned. You were wondering what was going on. But we are here another full week, a lot to talk about, a lot to catch up on. But we pray that you are staying safe and following social distancing rules, doing the things that are necessary to keep yourself and your family safe. We hear all of the upticks that are happening with coronavirus and those states that didn't pay attention, at least here in New York, our governor was very clear about the guidelines that he put forth and he's not afraid to set some more if we get out of control up here, but really praying for safety for everyone and that you use wisdom because there's a lot culturally going on dealing with this coronavirus. But Mr. Russell, voice Russell, over to you for your greeting. Hey, 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 I just want to say hello to everybody. You know, we're showing real time. So uh, we're moving and grooving. I'm in the office over here and uh, rearranging and setting up stuff so we can have this conversation today. And as you can see, I always have a shirt, right? So here we go. Power to the people. Although the subject matter today doesn't look like we're using the power in the right way. And uh, we have to speak to that because if we're going to be a show that talks about the culture and the legal, sometimes it's not all good and we need to talk to that as well and so we will do so and start us our, our show today with what what has been leading in the news all week which is the uptick in violence in our community it's it's beyond ah, proportions and i am directly affected by it by a girlfriend son who was murdered uh saturday night in Brooklyn, New York. It made the news because it happened within less than a mile of where Mayor de Blasio was giving a peace rally. So it, it's just, I don't even understand what we're doing, what's going on. And that very next Sunday, I had to moderate a peace rally in Queens, New York with our district attorney, our Queensborough president and all of our elected officials of Southeast Queens because crime and gun violence has gone up 250% in the borough of Queens. So I, I really don't understand what's going on with folks and this gun violence. And you did a live about that before on Instagram saying, put the guns down. I, I, I mean, look, we have a narrative that's out here for which um, somebody's going to take hold of. Uh, and I think it's a false narrative, but they're going to take hold of it. And the narrative is, is that we need more policings in our we need more policing in our community, a community that's already over policed, uh, underserved in many other aspects, but over policed, and the militarization of police is needed. Um, and storylines like death within our community will enhance and push ahead the false narrative that you can't do away with the street crime unit for which de Blasio and the, and the commission, the police commissioner has done away with. You need those street crime units to keep guns off the street and to keep deaths down. And so I think you mentioned some numbers. I mean, it's not only New York. I, I, New York is what we're gonna talk about, but in Atlanta, 300% uptick in killings today, gun violence. In New York, the state of New York, 157 uptick. This is percent as opposed to last year. So not only are we killing one another, whether there is some motivation behind it that is of criminal nature, we are killing innocent bystanders. And let me tell you, no jury is gonna be sympathetic to anybody that pulls a trigger and it kills an infant and it kills a young one and it kills someone that had a future or was not involved in the gunplay. And night after night, I see different scenarios. Uh, just the other night, somebody drove by in a car and they shot someone in the head while they were sitting in their car. Now, there used to be a time that I would say that, you know, usually when there's gunplay, the person that get hit and the person that fired know what happened between each other. It's just not random. It's just not something that happens out of the blue. But I must say, I've been, I have abandoned that thought 
um, because too many innocent people are getting killed. And I just can't believe that many people within our community hate one another. I, I can't imagine that. And so I can't imagine that. So I want to talk to some of the things that may be causing it and plead to those out there as we meet, as we take the cultural and the legal and infuse it, because I'm going to drop some science on what the penalties are. Uh, mm. You need to know. It's just not going to be you going to Rikers and hanging out with your other Bloods or Crips or some other people or Latin Kings, who whatever you're involved in, whatever organization. And some of the organizations do great work. The Latin Kings started out doing great work. Um, you know, whatever organization or gang that you're with, it's just not going to be a party in the picnic. You know, and and if the feds pick up these type of cases, like in the Bronx, they have picked they have picked up a lot of the cases of the of gun cases and other violent cases because of lack of convictions. Um, then you're really talking about serious time. I mean, just for the mere gun possession alone, in in the state of, in the state of New York, as far as a federal offense, you're looking at five years, just right off the bat, just for possession. We're not even talking about uh, discharge. If you're looking at discharge, you're looking at anywhere between seven to 10 years. Easily. No questions about it. And that's the mandatory minimum. And so what do I mean by mandatory minimum? I'll take my time because Dr. Stacy will tell me to take my time and, and, and break it down. So before you get ready to say break it down, let me break it down. Federal level, mandatory minimums. That means no matter what the judge wants to do, no matter what the U.S. attorney wants to do, if the sentencing guidelines is a mandatory minimum, that means you have to serve that minimum amount of time. So gun possession, five, seven, and 10, depending upon how it was used, whether it was discharged, whether it's displayed to be displayed uh, in the furtherance of commission of some other crimes, um, or whether it was just straight possession. Usually where there's guns, there's drugs. Usually where there's guns, there's violence. Usually where there's guns, you're going to display it. So looking at a span of anywhere between five to 10 years and the judge can't do anything about it. Hmm. So no matter what the case and the circumstances, that's automatic. Automatic, automatic. That means that if you get charged with it, you're doing the five, you're doing the seven or you're doing the 10. And that's consecutive to any other crime that you may have been committing. So therefore, if you have a gun on you, and you're selling drugs, that is separate. So the gun, you get the five, the selling the drugs will be consecutive time. And when I mean consecutive, that means added on to. Concurrent means running together. Consecutive means one right after the other. And so you can see quickly how the House of Horrors is built when it comes down to federal prisons. And that's on the, that's on the federal le level. Exactly. What, I would pause because I'm cracking mm -hmm. up. Shawnee said, "Good grief, Charlie Brown." Yeah, this is this is real. Mm -hmm. Why I always ask you to break it down because we have people tuning in who are parents, who are aunts, who are godparents, who are grandparents, and sometimes children are involved in things and you don't know. You don't know what they're bringing in the house. And even at the peace rally this past Sunday, one of the individuals who were talking, um, the Fatado brothers who are out here on the street doing work every day, trying to stop and de-escalate violence in the community. He was like, look, you need to go search the rooms, search underneath beds, search everything. No one gets a right to lock a door if they're not paying mortgage or rent because you don't know what they're doing and who they're oh, doing. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Can you repeat that line one more time? I think you said something about locking doors and mortgage and rent. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> They you don't get the right to lock the doors or hide anything if you're not paying mortgage or rent. Okay. And some folks allow their kids to do that, and then they have guns or weapons in there that they've gotten from friends or they're involved in gang activity and you don't know. This is where the legal meets the cultural. So let's be real. In our communities, we can't afford to turn a blind eye and act like we don't know things are going on or at least not do our due diligence to try to find out. And um, once again, we're in the in the era of social justice, and we've been marching, talking about Black Lives Matter, and Black and Brown Lives Matter. And if we now, once again, there's no correlation, but you have to you have to admit, if you're saying, hey, police officers, don't brutalize us, don't treat us less than human, you also have to be saying, put the guns down, and let's treat one another as if we're human 
and more than human. There is no rational reason for the police to do what they do. There's no rational reason for us to do what we're doing in our community one way or the other. Now, you can get a doctor on here and they, and they will tell you and psychologists and, psych, and psychiatrists and therapists. I mean, there's a lot of things that come into play. You have uh, lack of uh, jobs, lack of recreation. You have in the house on quarantine, uh, this new life that we live where you have masks and you can't hug and touch and, and really feel the energy of the next person. That exists, but we all know in the summertime, there's always an uptick in violence. And this is not new, but the numbers are extraordinary. And when you have President Cuckoo <laughs> up there, who we have seen in Portland use uh, the armed forces, you can see him trying to rationalize why that should happen in a Chicago, that should happen in Atlanta, that should happen in New York. And you have heard some storylines where the mayor in New York has said that he will not let that happen. But we've seen this, this uh, mayor flip flop before and sometimes try to put his feet in the shoes that's too small and sometimes put his feet in shoes that are way too big uh, in reference to uh, his reaction to the city's crisis. Um, that's, you know, and that's, and that's, that's a reality. So uh, killing in our community is never going to be thought of lightly. Um, you can almost bet your bottom dollar that jurors are going to rail against that. So a conviction is coming um, if you're found with a gun. Um, and believe me, police will be more aggressive in trying to disarm those. So you will see whether the media picks it up or not, um, illegal stop and frisk, because at the end of the day, somebody's going to say that it's better to have a lawsuit where the city pays out some money because of illegal stop and frisk rather than have someone killed. And you have to make a choice. Us attorneys, attorneys have to make a choice in fighting in civil rights and, and dealing with cases of false arrest and police, police brutality whether or not we're going to take on a case like that. You know, that's a moral and a legal question. Would you take on a case where someone was stopped illegally and a gun was found on them, knowing what you know about what is going on in our community? Yes, there is a civil action there. The stop was illegal and it shouldn't have happened. Gun was found and maybe the gun is thrown out during trial or maybe the gun is taken from you and you held 24 hours and you let out the back door. Um, those things also occur. But, uh, you know, who's raising their hand to take that type of case? You know, being a person of the community, and this is why I preach, you know, talking about dealing with folks in our community, experts in our community, folks that practice in this area, civil rights, false arrest, even defense work, criminal defense work in our community, because there's certain sensitivities. You know, I necessarily wouldn't take a case like that because I am not only looking out for your rights, which I understand, but also I have a community that I have an obligation to. And what are we saying when that happens? So we need to be mindful, mindful of all of this um, as the days go on. Well, you know, as you're you're talking in, uh, Sandra made a point, you know, going back to what I said before about knowing what's happening in your home. She spoke about conversations and having conversations with your children, which is important because if you have that dialogue it makes it better or better odds for you to find out things. But there are also times when children are slick. They know what to say and how to say to keep you off the beaten path. So, you know, no one's exempt from the influence of peers and peer pressure. So it's a multi-layered approach to how we deal just in the home and watching what's going on so that we can try to mitigate these situations where our children are involved in uh, gun violence. And she also mentioned that, you know, people are being released. So that could also be a reason for some of the violence and the uptick because jails are released. Now, I'm not sure uh, what the stats on that are. You might know, Mr. Russell, I'm not sure. But there's a, a myriad of reasons why we are seeing gun violence. And yes, there are mental health challenges. There's financial impacts. There's broken home issues, but the bottom line is we should not be using guns to solve the problems that are happening 
around us. And I, to feel so empowered to take someone's life when you didn't give life just totally baffles me. And it's really disturbing. And once again, we talked about we can't wait for somebody to come save us. We have to save ourselves. We have to do what we can to support those organizations like Life Camp, like the Fatada Brothers, like Fathers in the Hood that are out there de-escalating this conflict that's happening in communities with our young people so we don't end up with these stats that everyone is touting. And like you said before, Mr. Russell, giving credence to the fact that we need police presence because we don't know how to govern ourselves in our own community. One of the one organization that's really doing uh, what I would call a, a really, really good job in trying to stop the gun violence is BRAG. And that's run by Good Shepherds. And the BRAG program, you know, they're out there. They have credible messengers out there either former gang members or folks that people respect in the community that saying put down the guns. You know, Erica Ford with Life Camp, you know, a Dave once again with Bragg. You know, these are the people that are out there that should be, you know, in the news. And we should talk about them as much as we talk about anyone else in trying to help our community. But let me just share some um, some real sobering information so folks know, right? So we look at assault in the first degree, and that's in that's when you have the intent to cause serious physical injury and you actually cause ser serious physical, physical injury. That's 25 years, right? You're looking at murder in the first degree, that's life to 20 to 25 years. Uh, any B violent felony, that is five to 25 years. A C violent felony, that's three and a half years to 15 years. A D violent felony, and that's just straight possession. That's a D violent felony. You have a gun, you didn't discharge it, you have it on you. That's a D violent felony. That's two to seven years. And an E violent is anywhere between one and a half to four years, you might get probation. There, That is an option. But in a day and age where we see in the uptick, I think that is unlikely. And even though we have bail reform, I don't believe that a judge is going to be too too lenient in allowing someone that possesses a gun or involved in a crime that deals with a gun out in the street. It is just, it's probably something that's not, that's not going to happen. And so therefore, since it's not going to happen, you shouldn't think that it is going to happen. You should understand that the likelihood and the probability of it happening is zero. And so I, I think we need to be mindful of that because that is if that's your first time offense, right? If you're a predicate, and that means if you have a prior felony, that means you've been here before, then the numbers escalate. And then we're talking about a different brand of numbers. So, and it's not, and it's, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. What were you going to say? Finish that thought because I have a question about what you just said with the minimum. Okay. Or this and, so, and so therefore, if you're a predicate, then the numbers shift and your time of sentencing could be longer. Now, I just want to make sure everybody understands, you know, oh, I didn't mean to shoot her. I didn't mean to shoot him. It wasn't meant to, to hit that person. That is not a defense. That means nothing. Because when you look at assault in the first degree, and you look at assault in the first degree, what I said is a B felony, it breaks it down. One of the, one of the um, elements and one of the charges under assault in uh, the first degree, I'll just read it briefly. The person showed a depraved indifference to human life. Depraved indifference to human life. That means if someone's standing in a crowd, you decide to shoot that crowd. That's a depraved indifference to human life. Not only to the person that you were intending to hit, but the other people. I go on, recklessly engage in conduct which creates a grave risk of death to another person. Well, shooting in a crowd, shooting in the street, you can't get more reckless than that, right? And of course, it's causing a grave risk to an, a grave risk to another person, and could cause death to that person. All right. And if it's in furtherance of a felony or attempted felony, which could be one, assaulting someone, or two, robbing someone, or three, um, you know, trying to cause some other type of physical harm or mis mischief to a person, then you also fall into that category. And when it comes to children, we could talk about reckless assault of a child, which is a D felony, you know, and assault in the second degree, which is a D felony. So you're still looking at anywhere between two to seven years. And as I said, in this day and age, no one's looking too kindly. And when we add insult to injury, right? When we really talk about living in the moment, 
just in Jersey the other day, a federal judge uh, son was killed right in her home and the husband was shot. And that happened in New Jersey. And, and that's, and that's, I missed that. that. Excuse me? I missed that. They were yeah, it, was, it was a federal judge for which a gentleman act like he was a federal express the uh, delivery or uh, they opened up the door. That person killed the son and killed and it shot the husband who was critically, sh critically, critically wounded. Um, and that was a federal judge. A federal judge happened to be in the basement when this occurred. So no one's going to look at violence lightly. Um, and in a time where you have civil unrest, at a time where you have protesters sitting at City Hall overnight and staying there overnight, which, you know, as of today, that no longer exists because the NYPD finest went in there and they tore down all the tents and they destroyed all the couches and pillows and everything that, that folks were sitting there for no longer exists. So you will not see the overnight that you saw before in reference to defunding the police. And I don't see how we can how one can have that conversation and also live in the area where violence is on an uptick. Unless we are prepared, this is what we talk about, uh, civil unrest, social justice, and being prepared for the revolution. Unless we have the infrastructure to police ourselves, which I'm suggesting we should, and I'm suggesting there's no reason why we can't. Um, the conversation of defunding and the conversation of safe streets is going to meet. So Sandra has a, a statement. She said, while well, I understand what he's saying, the sentencing varies between black and white people. That's sad. That's the sad part as we go for the same crimes uh, committed. So, yeah, but, you know, I, and I understand that and I can appreciate that. But we, what I'm talking about is pre converse pre that, right? We shouldn't be in a position where we're talking about the differential, the differences and the distinguishes, distinguish, distinguishing points and references sentencing compared to black and white. We know it exists. Like, we know the game is rigged. We know it is. We know that if I hop the train and one of my Caucasian friends hop the train, uh, I might get a ticket and have to go to court and they may get a pass. If I hop the train with a hoodie on and my baggy pants, I know I'm getting locked up and the white guy hops the train with a hoodie on and baggy pants, he might get a ticket. Whatever is the worst, we're going to get the brunt of that. And we see that globally. And I can appreciate that and I understand that. But what I'm suggesting and what I'm talking about today, which is recognize that and let's save our communities. And I would be remiss in a show that calls itself bringing culture and legal together that I don't talk to what's staring in my face, right? And what's staring in my face is nightly information about what is going on in our community that's detrimental when it comes down to police shooting. We already know that the media is already skewed to vilify us. We already know that. But a fact, but a fact is a fact, right? I mean, like the fact ain't going away, right? I mean, the fact is, is that despite what we do, we are the most affected by unemployment. There's some things that can happen to adjust that. But the fact is, is that, you know, the numbers percentage wise puts us in the forefront. The fact is, is that our community is over policed and underserved in so many other areas, but there's also shooting and killing in our community. And it's not one for one. I'm in a gang, you in a gang, which is horrible in and of itself. Is I'm in a gang, I'm shooting at you, or I'm not in a gang and I'm shooting at you, and I'm hitting that one year old. And this, you know, I mean, this is not new, but I thought we evolved in that. There was a time back in the 80s where you couldn't go to a street basketball game, whether it was in Harlem or whether it was in the Bronx, because if you stayed for the last game and the, and the lights went out, something was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But not 157 percent uptick in 300 in Atlanta, and you know that those numbers are outrageous. It, it's beyond outrageous, and 250 just in Queens, like that's crazy. But I want to go back to the fact that you gave us the sobering reality of the mandatory sentencing if you have a gun. Now, what if someone has a gun? You don't know they have a gun. Cops come, they throw it in the back of your car. You're the registered owner of the car. What happens to you? All right. So when I spoke about the mandatory, that's on the federal level. On the state level, you have the ranges. You have the two to five, the seven, seven, two to seven, the three and a half to 15. You have ranges. But 
on the federal level, they're mandatory minimums. But if that were to happen, <laughs> and then it's, you know, this is one of those times where, you know, both parties are going to be arrested because the police are not going to lean on the fact that because you're the owner of the car, that means that is your gun. What the police will do is arrest both parties and let you guys sweat it out. Let the two parties fight among themselves. And they should, right? Because if you allow someone in your vehicle and you didn't know they had a gun and all of a sudden the gun is found and you know that they put it there or you didn't have a gun in there, um, you know, people say, oh, snitches get stitches. That's not snitching. No, no, no. You shouldn't have put me in that position, bro. You knew you had it. You didn't tell me you had it. You got in my car and then the police stopped us. That is no snitching. That's an exception to a whole bunch of rules. That means you're trying to play me for a fool. And a matter of fact, I should be, I'm not even going to say it because you put me in a position like that. You know what I mean? Why would you want to do that to me? And what I'm supposed to stand tall and eat it and say, I don't know who gun that is. Why? That's foolish to me. I don't understand that type of logic. That makes no sense. Are we going to the store to, to grab a bag of chips? And we get in the store, all of a sudden you pull out a shotgun and you jumping over the cash register and someone gets injured. I'm supposed to eat that? Well, we, we know that's part of the challenge culturally, right? Sometimes we feel like we can't say anything or there's pressure because you're with somebody. You didn't know what their intentions were and now you're caught up in it. That's why you have to know the company that you keep. Right. And it used to be and it used to be a time where, you know, you had a you had a gun and misdemeanor and, you know, they'll give you probation and you move on. No, that's not happening now. That's that's not happening now. Unless you have a gun inside your home and it's inoperable and, you know, someone enters your home and it never leaves out of your home, then you might be talking misdemeanor because it's in your home and it's not operable. But or the case might get thrown out. But if you have a gun and you have it on your person and you outside of your home and outside your place of business, you got a problem. And we didn't even mention if the gun is stolen or the serial numbers is crossed out. Then you got a whole nother you got a whole nother set of of, of worms that you have to deal with. Uh, and the penalty just escalate. And if the gun is dirty, we don't know. And when I say by dirty, that means it was used in another crime. Um, it was used in one of these shootings of an innocent bystander. Now the pressure is really on. And you're going to see the pressure on because no one in any community is going to stand for that. Just not. It's just not going to happen. Everybody wants to be safe. It's, the issue is, is how we go about being safe. I believe that community policing is how you make sure a community is safe, where everybody's engaged and everybody's involved. And the police are not strangers. As a matter of fact, police live in, in the five boroughs. They understand what's going on. There's a relationship with those in a community. We know who's heading to Harvard. We know who's heading to Hofstra. We know who's heading to Hostos. We know all these things and we can work around it. We know who has uh, uh, mental challenges, who has you know anger challenges, or just who's on drugs and who's not. That's where the community policing comes in. And, you know, I, I, I would contend and assert that with that, then you have a downtick and you have a, a downward trend of police, I mean, of, of gun violence, but we don't have that and, well, and we see the effects. So I definitely agree with everything that you're saying. And in addition to that, when we talk about funding and we talked last week about the budget and we've been touching on where money is being spent, this is a prime example that we need more activities for our young people. Activities not only for them to have recreation, but activities that show them how to have legitimate businesses, that they can earn a dollar legally and not out here on the street trying to do things because they want a fast dollar. And that speaks to a holistic approach on reforming how we operate and the things that we do to empower our young kings and queens to really walk in that kind of legacy and not one that puts them behind bars. So yeah, I, I would agree with you. And the people have jumped on to defund, defund the, the police and went straight to you know, the negative. That means everybody's going to go wild and, and people of color don't care about their community because they don't want their community police. No. And don't even try to take it there. What we're saying is use the money appropriately in other areas that will create a circumstance and a scenario where you are no longer needed. That's it. You are just no longer needed. And that's, and that's important 
to us. And, and that's where we need to be. And, and that's an aspirational goal that I pray in my lifetime, we can see us get to the point where we behave in a way that we honor who we are, because part of it is, you know, that could be a whole nother history lesson of being detached from who you are, not knowing where you come from. Our story didn't begin. Our narrative didn't begin on the transatlantic slave trade. Our story began, you know, centuries before with us building the pyramids, us creating science and technology. So that's a whole nother part of educating us to who we are so we can love ourselves. Because a lot of the things that we see, it's because we don't honor who we are. We don't appreciate the skin that we're in. And those are layers of challenges that we have to work through. But right now we see the entire pot of issues and challenges all bubbling up to the top. Is it a fever pitch? And I'm just praying that as we do this show, where the cultural leads the Meagol, with the, all the other information and resources that we provide in our daily lives that we can move the needle forward. We're seeing real change, not just rhetoric, not just talk, but real reform and change in our communities. So um, now one of the things that um, you talked upon uh, last week, and you know, at some point we'll make the trans transgression to this next area that I would like to talk about today, because it's still criminal, it's, it's, it's still crime. Uh, we talked about the march and support of black businesses. Now, I don't know if Dr. Grant, you have the capability of doing this, but I sent you a couple of things that I would like for you to try to share and post. So I'm gonna talk through it while you try to do that and, and set it up. Um, you know, we can talk about gun violence and we can talk about policing our community forever. And a matter of fact, we had a segment that we wanted to show in reference to um, a police officer being stopped. And we could talk about that and show that a little bit later. But, but you went to a rally the other day um, and it was referenced to supporting black businesses and how this is the time to do so. And this is part of the social injustice. Well, you know, taking that to the next step. And once again, when we talk about culture and legal, we're going to put it together. And sometimes we like to categorize our shows. But as you, as you have warned me plenty of times, Dr. Grant, that our show is moving. So even though we may want to talk about landlord and tenant one week, and we may want to talk about you know uh, police shootings or police abuse in another in another week, sometimes uh, what happens is things in the news move us to do stuff differently. And today was one of those uh, days where we was going to talk about you know a police stop, but what moved us is the shootings that are happening in our neighborhood and the fatalities. But getting back to your protest and your rally uh, with other black businesses and getting back to theft and crimes, I want to touch on what we call patent racism. And what has brought me to speak about this is that I am watching this, I wouldn't even call a battle, the crime that is happening right before our eyes and is happening in the business world. And that is the company or a product called Fancy Feet, which is basically committed patent infringement of a product called U-Lace. Now, I must tell you, a crime is a crime. You know, we try to distinguish white collar versus uh, street violence. A crime is a crime. And we're going to put on blast anybody that we see committing such where we can inform the community about the stealing of our history. So we're gonna go back to that, uh, but here's the product called U-Lace. Uh, 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 Tyless shoelace that where you could design your shoes any which way using multiple, uh, multiple shoelaces or fragments of a shoelace that interlock to create colors and create designs. And, and, and that company has been around since 2008, black owned by a gentleman by the name of Tim Talley. And he's done, he's done wonders with the company. And he's been featured in, in magazines overseas, selling on Amazon, selling in brick, brick and mortar um, stores, um, selling direct. Uh, and you should go look at ulace.com and order a pair of these uh, tieless, no tie shoelaces. Um, wonderful product, but here's the crime and here's the history. 
And here's the, and here's the place that we're at today, right? So we're talking about social injustice. We're talking about how the theft of our history, we have here again, a theft in, in our business, in our culture, in our history by Fancy Feet, who's decided that they want to now create a shoelace, which or no tie lace, which is a patent infringement on a black owned company. This is not the first time we've seen that. We've seen it before. Hence the article that talked about uh, patent racism, right? And so you can see how beautiful you lace is. Why would anybody else want to buy a product called Fancy Feet? I don't know if you have that. If you can show that fancy feet, I don't want to give them any publicity, but I want to shame them to death because their product is flimsy and shouldn't be on the shelf. And whether it's Amazon, whether it's Macy's, whether it's Walmart, whoever decides to put this on the shelf, we're coming after you because you are aiding and abetting in patent infringement. You are aiding and abetting in a crime and you're aiding and abetting in the theft of someone's idea and a person of color. So if you can go back to the patent racism for a second, that article goes through the history, the history of how America has been built on just lifting ideas from people of color. Everybody heard of Lewis Latimer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like we can go on with a couple of names, right? Where we have designed it, we have created it and someone else has profited off of it. So I'm asking everyone out there in the world, be mindful, pass this on to someone else and keep on passing it on and on and on and on. You want to boycott and not buy any products from any product called Fancy Feet. You want to make your voice be heard, whether it's Macy's, whether it's Walmart, whether it's Amazon, that you will not stand for the patent racism and the patent infringement. And do you have another picture of you lace? Because I want to make sure that our audience sees exactly what they should be buying. Well, I'm going to show the infringement folks first. Let's there see. You go. Uh, okay. Amazon Smile is trying to interrupt, but we want you to see what you shouldn't be getting. That's right. Been there it is right there. It's no go. Shouldn't even be in our cart. Direct indirect, and you should have your voice heard. Pass it on to friends that there's no way that you're going to allow this theft to take place. There's no way you're going to allow this infringement to take place. And we know that when it comes down to the legal system, that that's an area that a lot of black and brown folks do not play in. They'll look the other way, say, oh, I've made my money. Oh, it's going to cost too much. I don't want to be involved in this legal battle. And so therefore they don't pursue it. Have you know, you lace the company, it will pursue this and we'll pursue and we'll pursue it until fancy feet is running out the door. <laughs> because somebody has told somebody that brown and black folks can't play in the sandbox when it comes down to protecting their economic interests and fighting for their economic interests. That is mm -hmm. not. That it's not cool at all. And, you know, I'm glad that we're bringing this up because there are a lot of people also in our communities that don't know the power of protecting your intellectual property or your patents or your inventions. And they can be preyed upon by people who are wiser to know what to do and say, oh, that's a great idea. And somebody goes and they take what you have and try to own it and steal it from you. We have a history of that. Patent racism is just one of it. So this is really important for those in our community that have companies that have products. Make sure you protect your products. Make sure you have a patent. You you have the rights to the things that you're selling so that if somebody tries to come and do what Fancy Feet is doing, they won't have a leg to stand on because this is a legitimate case that ULACE is going to be able to fight. And ultimately, we proclaim victorious because they have the patent on this. And that's the importance of protecting what's yours, whether it be your intellectual property, whether it be your patent or invention, just don't do something that's phenomenal and great. And you don't do the due diligence to go the next step and make sure that it's protected and that nobody can steal it from you. 
Can you, if you can, I'm going to speak through this. If you can, just show the packaging of U-Lace, if you can. I think it's really important for folks to see what the packaging look like so they know what to look for. And the reason why I'm blowing this horn so loud and I'm blowing this horn for whatever time we have remaining on uh, speaking legally is because there are accomplices to this. See, so now here's, here's, here's the correlation. <laughs> You know what? This is beautiful. It's happening in real time, right? So when we talk about police misconduct and we talk about excessive force, we always talk about going after the bad actor, going after the person, the one that hit you, the one that beat you, the one that grabbed you, the one that forcefully arrested you, going after that person. That's the bad actor. But the bad actor doesn't stop there. There are other people that are bad actors, those that fail to intervene they're also bad actors. So what do I mean by that? That's the officer that stands on the side. That's the officer that doesn't say, stop what you're doing. That's the officer that doesn't report it. So now let's take that and I'm gonna take it real slow and let's take that analogy and let's bring it over to the patent infringement. And there's you lace right there. Let's take it over and let's bring it into the area of, of patent infringement and let's apply it to you lace and fancy feet. You lace, Patton, did all the right things on the market, ready to sell. Fancy Feet, bad actor, comes in, commits patent infringement, uh, is doing a knockoff, all right? Officer in a police scenario who's on the sideline doesn't do anything. In the infringement matter, Macy's, Amazon, Walmart. They're the officers that fail to intervene. Why do they fail to intervene? And why do I call them failures to intervene and call them aiders and abettors? Is because they're selling this product. They've been put on notice that this product is infringing on someone else's someone else's patent. They've been on notice that this is infringing and it's the stealing of history that's going on from people of color in reference to you lace being founded by a person of color since 2008. And they're participating. They cannot participate. They can say we don't want, you know, to be part of the theft. Let's contact you, Lace, uh, directly, and let's create a relationship. Because that's what the that's what the rally was about the other week was creating relationships and opportunities for people of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Create a relationship. And therefore, have this product now in Macy's, have this product, have you lace now on Amazon and, and just you lace itself, have you lace in Walmart, uh, and that's it, you know, not deal with uh, an infringing product. But they decide not to. They turn a blind eye. They say, that's your battle. That's not my battle. That sounds very familiar. That sounds like somebody says, no, oh, I didn't own slaves. I wasn't born then. I have nothing to do with that. Oh, really? Is that how you see it? But you're reaping the benefits from it. This is the same exact thing. So I wanted to take time out to one, talk about it from a legal perspective, talk about it from a cultural perspective, inform our viewers, tell them to tell two friends and they'll tell two friends and so on and so on and so on. I got that from a commercial year. I didn't lift that myself. I just want to be honest, make sure nobody comes after me for anything. Um, because that's what we do here, speak illegally. And we'll do it all day and all night. And, and you know, my God, and I forgot to say hello to my partner, Ed Pachado, who is traveling <laughs> across the waters. Yeah, he is. He left us, he left us alone, but mm -hmm. with us in spirit. And we appreciate everyone that tuned in as well from Ed's page and interacting with us and being a part of getting Speaking Legally out into the mainstream so that we can continue to talk about the legal meeting the cultural and the information that we need to be aware of. But this one, you lace, that's near and dear to me because I own a couple of trademarks. And if I had the patent, I'm working on something for a patent, I would be hot if I was Tim. So I know that he is working hard to make sure that this lawsuit, if it goes into that and they don't back down, goes into effect. But I think what you said is important. The bad apples that are being supported by that's folks right. who carry them. Like, that's what we also have to, to point out. Like, don't be a, a, 
a part of the problem. Either be a part of the solution or you're a part of the problem. And those people that are carrying fancy feet, they're part of the problem. And it ain't even those people. It's the Macy's. It's the Amazon. It's the Walmart. We know who they are. I follow the story closely because that's what we do. Well, they need to stop. And, and you know, it's economics. At the end of the day, we keep talking about a lot of pieces, but economics has a lot to do with it. If we stop buying, they start feeling. And where we spend our money, you know, I shop at Macy's. Macy's has been one of my sponsors, but I'm sad to hear that they are doing or carrying fancy feet. I'm going to have to call some folks and have a conversation. Like, yeah. that and, that's, and that's what needs to be done. I mean, that's look, we, we have social media. Social media rules the world. Um, you're going to see it out on social media. That's where I found it out in social media. And I thought, hey, look, let me speak to this because we can always speak to the obvious. We all, we, I mean, look, the channel four is no different than channel five. Channel five is no different than channel seven. Channel channel seven is no different than channel two. When it comes down to the shows, the, the news, how it repeats, right? You can catch one story on one station. If you miss it, you can catch it on the other station. We're not trying to do that here. Anything that we see is unique that needs to be spoke to in the legal arena and and, it, and bring some cult cultural highlights and support us culturally, we'll do so. So hats off to those that are fighting out there and uh, brother Tim Talley, keep on fighting. Absolutely, thank you, Shawnee. She said always some great gems being dropped weekly. Thank you, Auntie Stacey and Brother Russell. I salute you. We salute you, sis. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, RT. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Frank. Everyone else that's been tuning in live with us today. If you're catching the replay, we appreciate you. Go ahead and share this broadcast and all of our broadcasts. We will uh, be posting a link that you can catch the replays from the previous show. But this was our answer in a time of challenge a time of trauma that we have never seen before, that we launched Speaking Legally so that you can be aware of where the legal meets the cultural. And you can also make sure that you have correct information for all of our, what I call sidewalk attorneys <laughs> that feel that they know the law. You have two legal professionals who can tell you day in and day out, this is what they do, criminal, civic, uh, civil cases as well as immigration cases. And we're going to get to that. Ed is uh, traveling, but you know, that's something that he is passionate about as well. And we have more to talk about because here's the challenge. Every day there's something new in the news and there's something that directly affects us. So grab your copy of Cardiac Arrest. Uh, a tactical guide on how to handle unlawful police stops. You know, read something before you need something. Right. In touch with these two attorneys. You can visit their websites, RoyceRussellEsquire.com or the law office of EdwardPichardo.com to get your legal representation when you need someone to advocate for justice on your behalf or just to have someone that you can call, even if it's not you, someone that you know that you can refer someone in our community who understands and knows what we're dealing with. So thank you for tuning in to today's show, being a part of our audience for your great feedback. And we look forward to, well, I know there was one thing we wanted to talk about today, Mr. Russell, but I know we're mm -hmm. about to wrap up. You sent me some information about the lawsuit with Monique. Oh, yeah. So that's, you, look, we, we need to table that for next week because we could talk about that and we could talk about Byron Allen. These are folks that are in the entertainment world that are fighting for their rights. She's she's fighting for which discrimination and wage and, and, and pay, uh, being a, uh, a woman comedian of color. And Byron Allen is fighting for the rights to buy and play in the big field of cable TV and own a network. And so we will talk about that. I mean, that is a fight worthy of talking about and is going on in the silence of other things and the ramifications of how courts decide on these issues and on these lawsuits will be very, very big. And so Monique has won her hurdle to move forward because they try to dismiss her case and that's not happening. And we need to keep our eyes on that because that's the news that our community needs to know about how successful people are fighting to make our world better and to make sure that the playing field is equal for us and others that come after us. And it takes a big person to carry that on by yourself. You haven't heard Monique reaching out for help. She's just walking the walk. You haven't heard Byron Allen reaching out for help. He's just walking the walk. And those who want to support him, come on. And that's what we're here for, to make sure that the cultural and the legal 
me. Absolutely. So thank you again, everyone. 